As we dive into the message this morning, I want to put an image on the the screen that I hope will kind of help us remember uh, what we've talked about. We've been talking about how do we build a spiritual life that will stand the test of time. And we began talking about the foundation being our identity in Christ. We, We build upon what Jesus says about us, who we are made and redeemed in God's image and then we talked about how we build on that foundation with the promises that God has made to us that's really what our faith is about it's about what God has promised and the mortar that holds all of that together is our faith our trust that God is faithful that what he has said he'll do he indeed will do and then last week we talked about the covering of that building being the the service that we do in Christ's name. We talked about offering unselfish, extravagant hospitality, both to God and to each other as we serve in his name. But as I started looking at this building, this spiritual house that we're building up in Christ, I I began to think there's one thing that's really missing in this picture. Now, I've, I've thought all week, okay, what do I call this in the house? Is this the, the insulation of the house? And, and it came to me later this week that maybe these are the windows of the house that lets the light of Christ shine through. Now, it's not on the, it's not on the image there, but for us to get at this missing ingredient, and really it's, it's critical to our spiritual life and our spiritual house, I want us to begin by looking this morning at Psalm 127, verse 1. Now, before we read that, I want to say to you, uh, I I need you to hang with me through the Scriptures today because we're going to read a bunch of them, all right? I'm just going to go ahead and let you know that up front. They're going to be on the screen. You can look at them on your your phone app or in your Bible. But hang with me as we go through these Scriptures because it's going to teach us a lot. But look at what Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. That verse really spoke to my heart this week, that as we talk about building a spiritual life, if we're the builder we've got the wrong person doing the building. Christ is the builder of our spiritual life. And only what He builds, only what He puts together in us will stand the test of time. So here's the key ingredient that's missing in the spiritual house. The only way that the Lord can be the builder of your spiritual house is if you give Him the control of it. The only way He can build your life is if you use the word I like to call surrender or submission to His authority in and over your life. Now I want to tell you something important. If you've got all the things we talked about in that image, but you're not submitting to the Lord's authority and control and leading in your life, you might be building something that's going to crumble over time. The Lord must be the builder of our house. And I can't think of any better story in the Scripture to teach us about submission than the story of Jacob. We're going to jump into the story of Jacob this morning and I want to give an overview of his life and what happened in his life. And here's why I want to do that. I don't want to just teach you and inform you. I want to go over these details because Jacob's story is your story. (laughs) Jacob's story is my story. And if we can understand what it took to get Jacob to a point of surrender and submission... Hopefully we can get there much sooner without as much heartache as Jacob himself had. Now, who is Jacob? 
Well, we've been studying Abraham, right? That God made a covenant with Abraham to make his family into a great nation. Well, Abraham had a son named Isaac. His name meant son of laughter. And then Isaac had a son named Jacob. So Jacob is Abraham's grandson. And because God had made this promise to Abraham that his family was going to become a great nation, that promise, that covenant that God made with Abraham was passed on to Jacob. Now, all of that sounds good so far, right? God has made this promise to Abraham. It's passed on to Isaac. It's passed on to Jacob. All of that's good until you realize who Jacob really is. And the way we learn about who Jacob is is really before he's ever born and at the moment of his birth. So let's look together at Genesis chapter 25 on toward the the front of your Bible, and let's read together verses 21 through 26. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah his wife conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, now listen carefully, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called him Esau. I'm surprised they didn't call him ugly, but they saw. And afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, or in Hebrew, Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Now, if you think it's hard to carry certain names... Imagine carrying the name Jacob. His very name means heel grabber. (laughs) Now I think we've got an image of what that might have looked like. His older brother Esau is born first. He's the first twin to be born. And then Jacob, even as Esau is coming out of the womb, Jacob is holding on to the heel of his brother. And metaphorically what that name means is trickster. In other words, what the Bible is telling us is that for the first portion of Jacob's life, he's going to get everything he wants through manipulation. He's going to trick people. He's going to deceive people. He's going to con people, even his own family, in order to get his way. So how do we see that play out in the life of Jacob. Well, the first way we see it play out is when he steals his brother's birthright. Now, at the end of Genesis 25, we're told that Esau, he was a man of the field. He loved to to work in the field and he loved to hunt. He's been out in the field all day and he comes inside and he's famished. And Jacob, the heel grabber, the trickster, has made some lentil stew. And Esau, coming in famished and hungry from his work, he begins to ask Jacob for some lentil stew. Now let's see what happens in Genesis 25. Let's pick up at the end of the chapter in verse 31. Jacob said to him, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. What use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, in one sense, this story doesn't make sense to me because I don't like lentil stew. If I had been hungry and that's all that Jacob had, I would have gone to McDonald's. I would have done something else. But evidently that was all there was that day to eat. 
And so he's so hungry that he's willing to sell for a bowl of stew his birthright. Now, that may not mean a lot to me and you, but in that day and time, let me tell you what it meant. It meant a double portion of inheritance. In fact, it meant that everything that belonged to Isaac, their father, would one day belong to Jacob now, not Esau, the oldest and the firstborn. So Jacob has just secured himself a secure financial future by manipulating his brother out of the birthright over a simple bowl of stew. Now this is not the last time we will see Jacob use trickery and manipulation. If you look over in Genesis 27, he really does the unthinkable as I look at it. The key to understanding what's told to us in Genesis 27 is that Isaac is going to bless his son Esau. Now, there's something important the Scripture tells us. Isaac loved Esau. He was his favorite. But Isaac's wife, Rebekah, loved Jacob. And one day, Isaac and Rebekah are talking, and Isaac tells Rebekah he's going to bless Esau and give him his blessing, and he sends Esau out to go hunt for food and cook it and bring it back to him so he can bless him. And while he's gone, Rachel comes to Jacob and she says, if you want his blessing you better get busy and so he tells his mother to cook two young goats and and the story uh, really gets kind of crazy from there he puts on some clothing that makes him feel like Esau who's so ugly and hairy he puts goat skin on his arms and on his hands and on his neck. He puts on Esau's clothes so he'll smell like a man of the field. And then he comes into his father, and here's where the manipulation gets at its worst. His father is blind. Isaac cannot see. And so he comes in to trick his father out of the blessing. And I want us to pick up in Genesis 27. Verses 20, or let's start in verse 22. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. Man, how hairy did that have to be? So he blessed him and he said, Are you really my son Esau? And he answered, I am. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. And then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, see the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Now listen to this part. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Now listen. This is the man who has inherited the covenant of Abraham from God. And as he blesses his son Jacob, even though it may sound like only words to us, he is literally passing on God's covenant to Jacob because God had said to Abraham, whoever curses you will be cursed and whoever blesses you I will bless. And so in a sense, Isaac is saying God's promise to Abraham, Jacob, it now belongs to you, even though he doesn't know he's giving it to Jacob. Now, it doesn't take a rocket science scientist to figure out what's going to happen after this, right? Esau comes home and he realizes that his brother now has not only stolen his birthright, he's stolen his father's blessing, the covenant that would have belonged to him and this is what scripture tells us about Esau in Genesis 27 
verse 41. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Esau is so angry, he's going to take the life of his brother. Well, I want you to think about the story in this way. It's important for us to consider. Manipulation, deceit, trickery. It's one way to get your way in life. And indeed, a lot of people do. They get their way in life by those things. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, when people have had enough of that, it always ends up the same way it ended up for Jacob because Jacob now has to run. And if you live your life by manipulation and deceit and trickery, you'll end up on the run like Jacob. He, he runs from the problems he's created at home. He runs to what looks like to him to be greener pastures. He runs to enter into relationship with people who may not know that he's the heel grabber even though his name says he is. But here's a spiritual truth you can write down this morning and you can take it to the bank because it's always true. <laughs> you might be able to outrun people, but who can you not outrun? You can never outrun God. No matter how far you run, no matter how fast you get there, God knows where you are. Don't we learn this throughout the Bible? Don't we learn it in the very first story of Adam and Eve? When they sin, they try to hide in the garden. God knows exactly where they are. We learn this later in the story of Jonah. Jonah runs from his calling trying to go as far from Nineveh as he can get. He gets on a ship and he ends up in the belly of a large fish. You cannot outrun God, He's constantly before you. But here's something interesting to take in this morning. Jacob heads off to go to greener pastures. He's going to go back to Abraham's homeland. And on his way, he meets God. Look at Genesis 28, verses 13 through 15. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now, folks, that passage ought to disturb you a little bit. Here's Jacob who's tricked his brother out of a birthright. Here's Jacob who's tricked his father Isaac out of his blessing. Everything he's ever done, he's gotten by manipulation, deceit, and trickery. And here God is blessing him. God doesn't say one word about the deceit. God doesn't say one word about the manipulation. And you know what? That used to bother me to no end until I realized we are all heel grabbers. We ought to be thankful that's how God meets Jacob. Because we've all put ourselves in the place of manipulating things or deceiving or tricking or lying to get our way. God could have called Jacob on it in that moment, but he doesn't. Now he's going he's to reckon with him. It's coming. But he meets him with grace. He meets him with blessing. And friends, that's how God meets us. There is a time, and we are in it right now, where God meets us in Jesus Christ with His grace. He doesn't meet us bringing up the whole past. He knows it. He knows we know it. 
And there's coming a day, friends, when that, that's going to flip. <laughs> there's coming a day when there will be a reckoning. reckoning. There is coming a day when God will come in His wrath. But we live in days of grace where God is willing to meet us in Jesus Christ and forgive us of all we've ever done. Why would we run from Him? Why would we turn our back on Him when He meets us where we are with grace and says, I'm willing to bless you right where you are? I want to ask you, have you received that grace? Have you opened your life to it? Have you opened your heart to it? Because Jesus so desperately wants to pour it in to your life today. Well, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up the story. Jacob finally gets to where he's going, and he builds a family. But Jacob the trickster is met by someone who's even trickier than he is, his soon-to-be father-in-law, Laban. And the story goes like this. He works for seven years because he falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. He thinks she's beautiful. And the Bible says he loves her so much that seven years are just like a day gone by to Jacob. But then on the wedding night, Laban does something kind of crazy. And he puts a veil over his daughter, Leah, and he gives Leah to Jacob to marry. And the Bible says simply that when Jacob gets up the next morning, there's Leah. <laughs> That's about the cleanest way you can say that. There's Leah. And Jacob is not happy because the Bible says that Leah is uglier than a bowling shoe. It doesn't say that, but it means that. And he's angry about it. The, the trickster has now been tricked and so he works seven more years he's finally able to have a wife in Rachel he has the two wives now plus two servants and they give him 12 children that become the 12 tribes of Israel but then after working his fingers to the bone he says to himself you know what I'm just going to go back home things are hard here I'm going to go back home but Jacob now has a problem because you remember who's at home? Esau's at home. And the last time Jacob was there, Esau wanted to kill him. And so on the way at the Jabbok River, he has his reconciliation with God. And the scripture calls it a, a time of wrestling. I would call it a kairos moment. It's where God's divine time intersects our linear time and we meet with God in a powerful way. And this is what the scripture says. Look at Genesis 32, verses 24 through 28. And Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have what? prevailed. Now, what do we see in this passage? It kind of sounds like Jacob prevails over God, but it's actually the other way around. God is now prevailing in the life of Jacob because you see, Jacob understands if I go across that river back home without God, I'm a dead man. If God doesn't help me, if God doesn't go with me, my brother's not, not only going to wipe out me, he's going to wipe out my whole family. 
You see, it looks like the angel is surrendering to Jacob, but Jacob is really the one who's doing the surrendering here. And let me point out the fact that when Jacob finally has that moment of submitting to God, his name changes. No longer is he heel grabber, he's now the one who grabs and holds tightly to God. And you see, all of us need that shift to take place in our lives. To go from trying to grasp at everything that life can give us and grasp for what we can get for ourselves and let go and start grasping for God. We need that kairos moment where we let go of the control and we give the control to our Almighty Father. I want to ask you this morning, where in your life is God calling you today to give up the control? Where are you still trying to make things happen? Where are you still trying to manipulate things to go your way? Where in life is God calling you to let go so you can grab on to Him? Take hold of Him. For you see, that's the truest meaning of surrender. It's It's not that we give up the good things in life. I know a lot of people who think that. Well, in order to be a Christian, I just got to give everything that makes up everything that makes me happy. That's not true. But you do have to give up your way and your control and hand it unto the Lord to do things His way. This morning, we're going to have a what I think is a very special time of invitation. And as we think about what it means to surrender to God individually, I want us to think about what does this look like for us as the body of Christ? As the church, what does it look like for us to give the control to God for Him to lead? So that he's the one out front. So that he's the one who gets the glory. The River Community Church has been a movement of God ever since the beginning. And we want it to continue that way. And so this morning when you came in, you might have noticed on your chair that there was a prayer card. I hope you still got that somewhere nearby. But here's what we want to do during the invitation time this morning. We... We want to invite you to think about, if, as you think about the River Church, what's your prayer for the church? How would you pray for God and the future of this church, to, for God's blessing to be upon us? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take some time. The, the band is going to come and, and lead us instrumentally. Uh, during this time so that you can pray and you you can write out that prayer. There's actually four different places you can go. Now, if you've got a pen at your seat, you're welcome to fill it out there or ask somebody to grab you a pen. But we've got two tables on the side. We've got a table in the back corner. And we've got a table up here. And you're welcome to come during this time and move around and fill out that prayer card. I've written mine out. And... What I want to ask you to do with it after you fill it out is just come, put it in this box. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to take these out and read them and try to decipher who wrote them, okay? We're going to take the box and we're going to put it under the stage in our worship area at 2410 Cleveland Highway. And literally every time we gather for worship, every time we stand to preach, every time we stand to sing praise to God, we'll be standing on top of the prayers of God's people for His church. And we want you to be part of that. And so after you fill out your card, if you or someone uh, could bring your card and just place it in the box and, and we'll transport it to be placed underneath the stage at the worship center. Uh, I'm going to say a quick prayer and then invite you to write your prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we let go, we surrender to you today. We want the River Community Church to be yours and yours alone. And Lord, 
we just let go today to give it to you. What have you called us to be as we seek to make disciples, Lord? Lead us ever forward in the future to show us how to do that and who you'd have us to reach. And I just pray today as we write these prayers, Lord, that it will please you and be a blessing to you and that you in turn would release your blessing upon us in ways that only you can. Bless this time of prayer, we ask Jesus in your holy name. Amen.